have uh, Dr. Eric Judd, one of my former residents, who uh, is uh, one, of, one of our excellent uh, renal attendings. I guess this, um, there's something about we're supposed to call you a kidney attending instead of a renal attending now, because there's this big hubbub about we shouldn't use the term renal or nephrology, we should use kidney disease. Yeah, right? people get confused with the term renal, but kidney was never an adjective. It's only a noun. I know. So it's a problem. Yeah, it's uh, it drives me crazy. Anyway, uh, we're going to uh, actually get to see some uh, urine microscopy today. Uh, our discussants, let's see. Our discussants, could you please introduce yourselves real quickly? Yeah, I guess I'll start. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Maria, and I'm tuning in from Guatemala. I'm really happy to be here, uh, especially because Drew and Sukriti have encouraged me to do so. So hopefully, I'll learn a lot. I have to like point out that um, I'm scared of everything, How, like whatever you want to call it, like renal, nephro, like yeah. it scares. Uh, it's very scary, so hopefully. So yes, but, but uh, urine microscopy bit. looks the same all across the world. We don't we don't have to uh, translate numbers or anything. Sukriti. Um, hi everyone, I'm Sukriti, and I'm tuning in from India. And like Maria, today is my first day discussing, so I'm really excited. Okay, and uh, Eric, why don't you introduce yourself and and tell them something about you. Sure. So I guess I would call myself um, maybe a journeyman or a scholar. I originally uh, studied engineering, wanting to understand how the world worked. And then I started medicine to understand how humans work. And um, really the questions that, that drive me are the why questions. So I moved kind of from the hows to the whys. And now I'm really interested in, in uh, physiology and how the kidney works. Um, my current research project is in xenotransplantation. We're learning a lot about how the kidney works by putting uh, pig kidneys into baboons. There's a lot of assumptions there uh, that come out. Um, so we're designing some interesting experiments. Sounds great. So you have some cases and some urine. So why don't, why don't you go ahead and uh, not, do you have slides for all this, Eric? Yes. Good. So, all right. So what I have is I've got about 10 slides that will just introduce us to urine microscopy. And then I've got about six mini cases. And then I'm going to have a whole bunch of images if we have time, just to kind of as a quick shot to see what we can identify. So I'm going to start by uh, introducing us to urine microscopy just so that we're all on the same page. When you order a urine urinalysis, it's a dipstick, but you will also get um, um, uh, a urine microscopy if there's something interesting on the urinalysis. The urinalysis is, has been automated, and that's just uh, you, usually a dipstick that um, is an automated process. But the urine microscopy is you, you take a sample of urine about uh, 8 to 10 milliliters, ideally, you spin it down for about five minutes, and then you uh, will have the heavier elements uh, come to the bottom, and that's called the urine sediment. About 4% of urine is, is solid materials. We take that sediment, we remove the supernatant, so there's about a half a milliliter left of urine. We resuspend it and then plate it and look at it under the microscope. And when you look at the urine under the microscope, you're really looking for three things, casts, cells, and crystals. And so here is a representative uh, urine microscopy. And so you'll see there's a cast here on the left and uh, eventually we'll be able to identify what type of cast that is. We've got some cells here, different cells, um, white blood cells, red blood cells. And then there are other things in the urine uh, that may distract us. Uh, in each of the urine, there's gonna be some amorphous phosphates and urates these, it's kind of like just uh, amorphous debris. And if you don't see this, even in a urine sample that's completely bland, 
you may have taken your urine from the uh, Foley bulb instead of from the actual Foley, um, which happens sometimes that you'll extract the urine and you get saline in your syringe instead of actual urine. Um, so that's, that's um, an interesting uh, problem that can occur. So when you're looking at the cells, you can, you'll only have five cells to choose from, red blood cells, white blood cells, renal tubular epithelial cells, uh, transitional or bladder cells, and squamous epithelial cells, which really only get into the urine through contamination as the urine falls out of the urethra. But um, the pro tip here is that the cell, the, the identifying the cells in the urine depends upon the size. So here you can see the squamous cell is maybe the largest, and this is a nice plump squamous cell, but most of the squamous cells you'll see in the urine are um, flaky and thin because they're, they're dead on the, on the external surface of the, of the skin. And then the transitional cell has a lot of cytoplasm and is much bigger, or it's smaller than the squamous cell, but still bigger than the renal tubular epithelial cell. The renal tubular epithelial cell has a bigger nucleus, less cytoplasm, and uh, they're rare to see, um, but it, it, does, it does identify pathology. Most of the renal tubular epithelial cells will be of proximal tubular origin, but some of them can be um, further down in the nephron. You have white blood cells, which are, which are smaller than, than the renal tubular epithelial cells. And because there's no staining in the urine, you won't be able to make out neutrophils versus lymphocytes. We rarely see lymphocytes unless it's a transplanted kidney. And then you have the red blood cell, which is obviously uh, doesn't have a nucleus and is a biconcave disc. This is a isomorphic or eumorphic or normomorphic, basically a normal size a red blood cell. There are other red blood cells that are pathologic called dysmorphic, which we'll see. And this is an example of, for size comparison. You have a renal tuber epithelial cell here, smaller than a squamous cell, which is, uh, and then about um, th three WBC diameters will get you to a renal tuber epithelial cell. And the red blood cell is classically half um, the diameter of a, of a white blood cell. So the red blood cell is the smallest. We've also got some other things in this uh, specimen here, some um, uh, crystals. Does anybody wanna volunteer what they think could be going on on those crystals, what those crystals could be? Salic acid. Yeah, so these are the most common crystal to see. Uh, I suppose the most common stone, but Maybe not the most common crystal, but uh, it's definitely a common. And this is a dihydrate calcium oxalate crystal. So uh, besides uh, cells, we'll also see casts. And just as a reminder, the cast form by a TAM horsefall protein that uh, is produced in the thick ascending limb, also called uromodulin. And uh, it's really there to help uh, prevent crystal formation in the supersaturated state. But um, things that uh, would be in the tubular filtrate will stick to this glue-like structure, the hyaline. And if you have debris or injury from the proximal tubular cells, you'll get granular cells, or sorry, granular cast. And that can be either coarse granular or fine granular. If you have a nephron segment that is really not contributing much to um, the uh, urine formation. You'll have low tubular filtrate flow, and then the hyaline can really become consolidated, and that will form a waxy cast. Um, the waxy cast sometimes will even be broad, which means that they can be in these uh, collecting ducts, which would drain more than just one nephron segment. The cast that we have to choose from are cellular or non-cellular. Uh, the acellular or non-cellular cast or hyaline which is basically just the hyaline material without anything stuck in it. And then you can have different things stuck in it, granular material from injury to the proximal tubular cells, and then waxy cast, which is just uh, a nephron segment that, does, that has low tubular flow and is not contributing much in terms of the urine. So that, that's how casts are formed. And here is uh, kind of your typical uh, example for um, um, muddy brown cast. 
and everybody knows what what muddy brown cast are, are associated with i'm assuming do we want to uh go, volunteer go ahead, and tell, go ahead and tell them eric oh, okay this is just atn so acute uh, tubular necrosis which interestingly is a spectrum and maybe more accurate to call ati which is acute tubular injury and then we have the waxy cast and uh I'm trying to move my chat to the side so I can see things. Um, and uh, Highland cast as well. Um, the waxy cast can also be seen here on uh, as part of these muddy brown cast. Hey, Eric, um, the muddy brown cast, what, what kind of sensitivity and specificity do they have for acute tubular injury? Okay, so that is a good question. If you see more than six muddy brown casts per low power field, then you're uh, then then you can use it as a biomarker for acute tubular injury. There's a scoring system that scores not only the number of muddy brown casts but also the renal tubular epithelial cells. Uh, this is work that was done out of Yale, and I don't know the exact I can't remember the exact numbers, but I would guess somewhere around eighty percent would be uh, this specificity. Great, thanks. Um, there is definitely not 100%. And then besides a granular cast, you can, or uh, the non-cellular cast, you also have cellular cast. Here is a granular cast with no cells. And then you have a WBC cast, uh, which is white blood cells. Um, here's a good example at the bottom. And then an epithelial cell cast, which is usually renal tuber epithelial cells, uh, this would also go along with acute tubular injury. The cast itself is identified by the Highland structure. And then if you see, if you can make out the type of cell that's in the cast, that defines the cast. So this is an example of a red blood cell cast, but you'll see there's also granular material in it. And that's usually the case if you've got uh, cells, you usually have injury uh, to the nephron segments too. And so you'll see some uh, um, debris in with the red blood cells. You can make out the red blood cells here, um, the same as the ones that are floating around. These interestingly are not dysmorphic. Okay, so we finished it with the background. Um, now we're going to get into some of the interesting cases for the discussants and for everyone else. So first off, uh, what is this? Okay, we're gonna let, we're, we're gonna we're gonna let our uh, two discussants uh, uh, make a guess at it first, just just so that they'll feel anxious. Don't feel anxious, Maria. All right, I definitely feel anxious, especially because I think we I, we just saw these, but um, I'd say they're somewhat cellular, so maybe like white blood cell cast. Okay. Um, but I'm really not sure about it. And if you're correct, what does that mean? Do you know? Um, well, like in anything else with white blood cells, I think about some sort of um, inflammatory process that could be, um, you know, like nephritis or just like a tubular interstitial nephritis or maybe like an infectious process. Um, Okay, so Eric, give her feedback. So first off, you got the cells correct. These are white blood cells. Um, but the tricky part about this one is that, and this is commonly miscalled a cast, um, if you don't resuspend your uh, pellet well, then you can get some white blood cell clumping, and it actually doesn't represent a cast. So this, these are white blood cell clumps. And the reason why it's so helpful is as you identified, the cast uh, lets us know where uh, the white blood cells got into the urine. So if you see white blood cells that are not in a cast, that could be an infection or, or things that, that, that are outside of the kidney. But if it's in a cast, then obviously it comes from the kidney. That is so interesting. Thank you. <laughs> okay, next. Okay, so um, I've got just some background on crystals so that we're familiar with crystals. We've seen these guys before, dihydrate calcium oxalate crystals. And um, 
each one of these guys is associated with different things. I'm not going to go into all of that, but I just wanted you to get some pattern recognition. Uh, uric acid crystals are rhomboid shape, and then these calcium phosphate crystals usually look like starburst. Uh, the triple phosphate or struvite crystals look like coffin lids. And um, if you have a very small coffin lid, sometimes it can be confused with an envelope. But these are the types of crystals that we, we may see and the links that we would have to pathology. Okay, so now we're gonna go into identifying things. So what is this uh, as number one here? So secrete, your, your, your turn to feel nervous. Um, so um, I think it's, uh, could be clumping. I'm still confused between whether this is clumping or a cast. Um, it looks cellular to me um, and I think it looks like an RBC cast if it's a cast because of the debris um, present. Uh, so that's what I think one is. Two is the RBCs. Um, three looks like WBCs to me. Yeah, that's great. Two is definitely RBC. Uh, you can see it's smaller than the WBC, doesn't have any nuclear material. And uh, three is our WBCs. But uh, this one here, this is a cast. It's not clumping. It's harder to make out on this picture, but there, there'll be kind of a highland outline, which you should see if you go up and down on the magnification of the microscope. Um, it's harder to see in just a still image, but th this is a, a cast. And um, this one of the reasons why I brought this up is it can be difficult to deter to see if there are any cellular components in here. Um, but this is actually just a densely packed uh, granular cast. So there aren't any cells uh, in this cast. So if you were to see a densely packed granular cast, what would that make you think of in terms of um, the kidney injury? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if the granular cast translates to like a muddy brown Gas that you see in uh, acute tubular necrosis, um, but that's what I think of. Uh... Yeah, granular cast typically represents some tubular injury, and if it's severe, then that would be ATN. Okay, great job. Uh, here's another um, image to identify. I guess we're back to Guatemala. Okay, so my turn. <laughs> I'd say like one, probably like a hyaline cast, and two, have absolutely no idea what is that. Um, or hmm, maybe not like a hyaline cast because now seeing it, like it has something inside of it, but definitely not um, cellular. So if it's not hyaline and it's not cellular, I mean, I'm in between like Kylene and like Guaxi casts. And then number two, no idea. Okay, yeah. Number one is definitely a Highland cast. You just have like ghost-like uh, outline with nothing inside. And then number two is a cell and it's a very big cell. Um, and it's not necessarily anything that identifies pathology. This is just a squamous epithelial cell. All right, great. Okay, so uh, those are the background uh, images. Now we'll go on to the, to the many cases. Um, so this is a 63-year-old man um, who is admitted with nausea, vomiting for two days. And the creatinine, the serum creatinine is 1.8 on admission, which is up from 1.1 at baseline. We have the a dipstick urinalysis with a specific gravity of 1.018, a pH of 5, the leukocyte esterase is negative, protein is trace, blood is negative, and glucose is negative. And the question is, what, what could he have in terms of the reason for the, the AKI? And then how do these structures help us identify that? It looks like we're go going back to Bangalore. 
Um, so um, this patient, um, maybe I could comment on the urine analysis first and then layer on the image findings. Um, so the specific gravity seems to be uh, normal. So it doesn't show any, uh, uh, any, any maybe like a concentrating or, um, or a diluting um, problem. Uh, I'm not sure what, if the pH value is normal or not. Uh, the leukocyte esterase being negative rules out uh, reasonably um, any sort of any urease producing organism like a um, E. coli. Um, the protein being traced um, again uh, maybe it would would rule out something like a um, like a nephrotic or nephritic syndrome uh, however on the urine analysis you only you can only catch albumin so um you wouldn't know if this patient had uh, like like a ben jones protein you'd have to do um uh, an electrophoresis for that uh the blood being negative um makes glomerular nephritis uh less likely or uh um something like a uh, um, uh, like a kidney stone or a bladder cancer and then glucose being negative um, that that makes diabetic nephropathy less likely uh, however the first sign is usually a patient with microalbuminuria with but with his creatinine being up so much from the baseline um, that doesn't seem proportional uh, coming to the image um it looks like a granular cast cell. So like you said, uh, this looks like ATN or tubular necrosis. And then B, uh, they look like uh, crystals. And um, so if I remember correctly, the, um, the rhomboid ones are, um, I remember the, the, the struvite ones were like coffin. Um, they were coffin shaped and I, th I think they're oxalate, but I'm not sure. Um, so if if I think about this as being an oxalate crystal, something like ethylene glycol poisoning um, could lead to the AT and, and the oxalate crystals, but I'm not sure. That's a great summary though. Uh, Dr. Centaur, do you want to add anything? Um, well, the specific gravity actually is uh, a bit elevated, suggesting that the patient's able to concentrate their urine. Um, and so uh, with the history, here, here's the big problem all the time. There's evidence and reason to think of a pre-renal problem, but always remember that, that volume contraction is the biggest risk fact, one of the biggest risk factors for acute tubular injury. And so that's what we always have difficulty there. So let's see how Eric analyzes this because I never look at urine anymore it, and it, I'm somewhat upset about that. And why don't we just have a quick aside about this, Eric? It's, it's I know over in Tinsley, you have a microscope room set up. I don't think we have that at the VA, although I'm gonna have to check. Uh, but I, I don't remember us being able to do it. Uh, and at many hospitals, only the nephrologists do it. Well, when I was an intern, I had to spin my own urines or else I was going to get yelled at. But that was uh, uh, like 536 years ago. So what about the access to microscopy? And then why don't you teach us about this one? So it is unfortunate. The, there are a lot of restrictions now. Uh, so we actually have to go down to the lab and the VA uh, and um, actually go to the area where the where they act, where they do the urinalysis and look at the um, urine microscopy there. Over at you, you uh, over at Highlands, we do the same was the same thing. We go over to the lab. Um, we have a lot of residents that use our microscope, and the high power is always uh, uh, blurred because. Uh, I think we've lost our skill in being able to maintain a microscope. 
So uh, I found that every time I come in, there is uh, urine particles uh, that have um, been stuck to the high power lens and you're looking through another urine sample to try to get to the urine sample. So it, it's really difficult to maintain a functioning microscope where you, that really gives you uh, the vision, the, the clarity that you need. Um, so this, this sample, th th as was correctly identified, this is a, a granular cast. And then we have some uric acid crystals here, rhomboid shaped uric acid crystals. Um, so the your specific gravity, you know, uh, the specific gravity tells us how heavy is the water compared, to, how heavy is the urine compared to, uh, uh, to water. And if you put a lot of crystals and other things in the urine, you'll actually raise the specific gravity in it. So it's not always a, a good reliable marker for the urine osmolality or the concentrating ability of the urine. But, but that being said, it, it does correlate fairly well. Um, when I see a granular cast in someone, uh, it means to me there's been some tubular injury. And so what I would do is I would be cautious in how much volume resuscitation to give them. So I would give them volume and see how they respond. But if they don't make urine, then I wouldn't continue to give them large amounts of volume. That's what the uh, that's how I, I use the urine in this um, in, in this case. So l l let me just summarize this, and make sure. And if anybody has any questions, please put them in the chat now. This is the patient that we assume with nausea and vomiting for two days has some volume contraction. And what we don't know is, is it pure volume contraction or is this early acute tubular injury. And I, I, love the, I love that phrase, acute tubular injury. And all we can do is give volume and check a response. Now, the other thing that I've, that I've been having, doing a lot when I'm on service, if I have a patient like this, I ask the residents to check the inferior vena cava for collapse with ultrasound, because that'd be another way to, to since physical exam is not very good for volume contraction, uh, ultrasound, I think, seems to be much better. And is do you, do you ever go down that route, Eric? Well, if you look at the randomized trials or the, the data, the IVC collapse is really best interpreted when the patient is intubated. So you really have to have the patient uh, to have positive airway pressure to interpret the IVC collapse. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, um, it can still be helpful. Okay. Yeah, but but if there's uh, um, now the there is some mention in the chat that this patient may have gotten a thiazide diuretic for their hypertension. Why would we consider that with these uric acid crystals? And is that something that's true? In the sense that uh, a thiazide diuretic would give you more uric acid crystals. Um, I think it does increase the. Uh, reabsorption of uric acid, but I'm not sure how it correlates with crystal formation in the urine or if that has to do with, I don't think it makes the urine more acidic that would precipitate the acid, but again, I think this is like a knowledge gap for me. I, th I think you're, you're very close. Um. Maria, do you want to add something? Um, yeah, for me as well, I'm not really sure if thiazides can acidify the pH uh, to um, increase the risk factors for uric acid crystal formation. But I was just thinking, you know, thinking about diuretics as a whole and how they might cause volume depletion and that in itself is a risk factor. Um, so I... I'd assume it is a risk factor because of the volume changes. Not as, not really sure if it can be a risk factor because of the pH changes, though. Yeah, I think if we combine the both of y'all's answers, we'll be right on track from my perspective. Uh, a thiazide diuretic it will increase your serum uric acid level, but it actually reduces your the amount of uric acid in the in the in the in the nephron in the tubular segment. Um, and we actually use thiazide diuretic sometimes to treat patients that would uh, be at risk, um, uh, I would say, um, 
for certain types of, of stones. In this case, it, um, we actually mainly use it for calcium, uh, but but there uh, the side effect regarding uric acid is an is an interesting one. Great. So yeah. So we re um, anything else we need to get out of this one? No, no. That that's that's all. Okay. So let's go on to the next one. So this is a 73-year-old woman with past medical history of hypertension, uh, coronary artery disease. Sorry about all the abbreviations. I wanted to try to fit, uh, take up as little space as possible. Heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. She was admitted to the ICU with strep pneumonia. Serum creatinine rose from 1.9 to 2.7 on day nine. This, your, your analysis shows specific gravity 1.012. PH 5.5, leukocytesterase 1 plus, protein 1 plus, blood 1 plus, and glucose negative. So what, how does the urine microscopy help us and what could, what are we seeing here? Hi, um, so we have this very sick patient in the ICU, so um, trying to like create a context for the urine microscopy, we have a patient that probably um, has a lot of problems controlling their volume and also can have a lot of medications that could contribute to something um, like a, some sort of damage. I'm not really sure what the cast is. I was trying to like figure it out, but she has like blood one plus and Lucas Esterase one plus, but I think it is a red blood cell cast. Um, I'm not really sure how, like, I'm not really sure how to correlate, like, um, the crosses of, like, a, just, like, blood one plus with, like, a microscopy, but uh, I'm, I think we can say she's having some sort of, um, hematuria, um, with just having the blood one plus, um, and then maybe some sort of glomerulonephritis that is a response to the um, infection she's had, um, like the pneumonia she has. So that is for A. For B, I have no idea what I'm looking at. <laughs> so I think that's the only thing I can add to this. That's great. That's great. Uh, we do see a cast here. Uh, the cells in these casts, however, and this is one of the reasons why I brought this case up, um, the cells that are in this cast have nuclear material in them. Um, so if it was a red blood cell, you wouldn't see any nuclear material there. So a white blood cell cast then? Yes. So this is a white blood cell cast. Now, does this white blood cell cast change our differential at all? Hmm. Like, I don't know, because for me, not specifically for urine microscopy, but like as a whole, um, white blood cells are very nonspecific. So in the setting of this patient where she's had um, like inflammation, infections, and changes in her urine, um, everything, I'm not really sure if a white blood cell cast can mean, like it's such a specific finding for me to change what, what, what I was thinking. Okay, that's a great <laughs> thought. I will say cellular casts definitely don't hone the differential in completely because there is overlap. If you have um, injury to the kidney, you can get uh, sometimes multiple cellular casts. I will say though, when you have a white blood cell cast, that oftentimes is not associated with the glomerular injury because the white blood cells don't get into the cast through filtration, but instead come through by inflammation of the, of the interstitial. Um, and so 
uh, and and these crystals here are uric acid crystals. Uh, we do see uric acid crystals quite a bit in the ICU. Uh, interestingly, because uh, propofol actually acts like probenicid and will cause uh, a reduction in uric acid reabsorption. So these aren't necessarily representative of, of the pathology, but does sometimes go along with uh, kidney um, or the urine microscopy for patients in the ICU. So uh, you may think, and I think it's very reasonable to think that this could be a post-strep GN, which would be, that would tend to have red blood cell casts. But uh, this patient actually had AIN, which was uh, acute interstitial nephritis, um, which uh, goes along with white blood cell casts. And that is related to uh, the antibiotics that the patient was receiving. So sometimes it's hard for us to differentiate between um, an, inf post, a, a, an infection related glomerulo glomerulopathy versus the antibiotics used to treat that infection. When we see red blood cell cast and white blood cell cast together, that sometimes can be lupus. Um, lupus uh, can cause white blood cells cast and red blood cell cast. But usually white blood cell casts are, are associated with um, just an AIN. Any other questions about, about this case? I will say also, that, oh, go ahead. Sorry, this is Drew. Could it also be that if she had an AIN that it might be the, the peptazo that she could have been getting from the strep pneumo given that she was admitted to the ICU and Definitely. Yep. Penicillins are um, common culprits for AIN. Eric, you just used the, uh, so the other, the other thing about white blood cell casts is it implies uh, pyelonephritis also. Um, and you're just using the clinical situation to distinguish between pyelonephritis and AIN? Yes. Um, you would have to take it into account uh, if usually if you have a pyelonephritis, the patients get well fairly quickly after the infection is treated. And so the timeline here would be really helpful. This is occurring kind of later in the, in the course. And on, on, on uh, slide B, is that, a, is, are those a, a lot of, uh, red cells around the urate crystal? They are, yes. These are red blood cells. And this is if you were to look at the crystals under polarized light. Great. Okay, let's go on to, to another one here. A 48-year-old woman with a past medical history of obesity, hypertension, diabetes, type 2, CKD stage 3A, who is admitted with acute cholecystitis. Serum creatinine was 3.1 on admission, up from 1.5 at baseline. We have a urinalysis with specific gravity 1.010, pH of 6, leukocyte esterase negative, protein 1 plus, blood 2 plus, glucose negative. Um, so I think looking at this picture, um, Right off the bat, A looks like RBCs, and B, um, I'm trying to distinguish between an RBC cast and a WBC cast. Um, it feels like there's a nucleus, which is why uh, I'm a little confused in thinking more about WBCs. Um, but in the context of the clinical picture, um, this patient has um, chronic kidney disease and um, an elevated serum creatinine. She also has um, elevated protein and blood. Um, so I would think this would be like a nephritic syndrome but um, um, I, I, 
she but she's also been admitted for this acute cholecystitis um so i'm a little confused i think uh maybe i think i can definitively say that a is an RVC, I think, but again, these look like nuclei. So, uh, I think I would like to know your thoughts. I'm not sure. Yeah, your microscopy can be tough. That's why a lot of it's just pattern recognition. Um, these these are these cells do have a nucleus and they're a little bit larger. Now, this is the same patient, uh, but we also have this on the urine microscopy too. Does that help? Um, so these are muddy brown casts, so um, they indicate um, tubular necrosis, and then um, uh, uh, thinking about um, whether this is like an obstructive cause or like a, a, a pre-renal cause or um, like a tubular cause, but you probably I don't know, maybe like a a, a, f, um, a fractional sodium or a urine sodium may help to differentiate this. I, I'm not sure how to make progress. Yeah, you, you, you got it. So if you have granular casts that show uh, tubular injury, then it, these uh, types of cells you may see in the urine, uh, these are renal tubular epithelial cells. So um, the uh, proximal tubule damage will cause these cells to fall into the urine space, and then they can be captured in a cast. This is a renal tuber epithelial cell cast. So uh, he, it's hard to see, but these um, cells are much bigger than white blood cells and much bigger than these red blood cells here. Uh, so that gives us some clue that they're, they're not white blood cells, but otherwise it would look similar to white blood cell cast. And this is a uh, characteristic of ATN, uh, which is what this patient has. Um, any questions about that? So the renal tubular epithelial cells are really important to be able to identify because in our, um, I guess, use of the urine microscopy, they are used in the scoring system to tell us not only how severe uh, of an injury does the patient have, but also how definitively or how certain are we that they actually have tubular injury. So these cells, if you see these cells, that's uh, a very good sign that there is um, significant tubular injury. Okay, so uh, do, are we okay to go to the next one? We're having a great time. The chat is going wild as usual. Okay, that's good. Um, all right, so we have a 61-year-old white or, or woman uh, with a past medical history of coronary artery disease and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. She was admitted with progressive dyspnea on exertion for one to two weeks. Serum creatinine is 1.3 on admission up from 0 0.8 at baseline. And we have a urinalysis for certain 1.015, pH of 6, Leukocytesterase negative, protein negative, blood negative, glucose negative. So what are we seeing here on our urine microscopy and how does it help us clinically? Hmm. Um, so I'm not sure again if they're like chylene casts or waxy casts. I think I'm having trouble like differentiating those two um, through the history. Um, I'd expect like chylene casts because I associate waxy casts with like um, chronic kidney disease, uh, which I don't think this pa this patient has. Although, um, yeah, because well, I, I don't know what like how long ago was his baseline, but I don't think this is like a chronic kidney disease. So I'm gonna go with chylene casts, and then. The other things, I'm not really sure what they are, but mm, definitely, you know, worried because of hit their like uh, creatinine uh, elevation. 
but I'm not sure if I can say anything from the year in my crust. Like, I'm pretty sure I could say something. I right now can't. And I'm not sure, like, how to, like, I don't know if I could say, like, it's pre-renal or renal. Um, so I'm, I'm going gonna... to go with hyaline casts. Okay, excellent. <laughs> I, I like your thought process, uh, Maria. Th these are hyaline casts. And Highland casts look different than waxy casts because waxy casts we'll see a little bit are, are, are really dense. So um, you're, they're not, you're not going to be able to see the, um, the light is going uh, is going to be more opaque as it, as it tries to get through. So um, the Highland casts are ghost-like, so you can barely make them out. In fact, a lot of the times the residents will have the scope turned all the way up for the bulb and it's so bright you can't even see the Highland cast. You actually have to dim it down to see them. But if you'll notice here, the Highland cast are pointing out with errors, but you also have a huge clumping of a whole bunch of Highland cast down here. We've got some Highland cast over here, and there's a little bit of debris in these casts, but not much, as well as up here. And you have uh, some granular elements, but it's not dominant. So now that I'm giving you that there, the patient has a ton of Highland cast on the urine microscopy, what does that tell you about how we should treat this patient? Hmm. Um, I assume like hyaline casts for me are very like non-specific, but they can be like I think I should like I should look more into like the specific gravity. That for me, it seems like she's concentrating urine with the hyaline casts. I think she's um she's maybe volume depleted and she needs like um fluids. So I think most of the time of uh, the association is Highland cast is pre-renal. And definitely that's what we have here, but it is a functional pre-renal, which means that the kidneys are being underperfused because the heart isn't working well. So this is a counterintuitive state where if you were to remove fluid, you actually improve kidney perfusion and that um, will allow you to restore the creatinine. So even though we're seeing hyaline casts, we actually need to diurese this patient. Are we okay with that? Identifying that functional so pre-renal? Cool. That's you know, doing great. Now, if I were to see a whole bunch of muddy brown cast here, then I would know that the patient had tubular injury. And if I were to try to diurese them, it may not be effective. Um, so those patients I actually might consider dialysis earlier, but also I would uh, be very careful in giving fluids to those patients because you can volume overload somebody if they're not making urine. Okay, so uh, let's go on now to, to another case. Um, so here we have uh, a 68-year-old woman with a past medical history of rheumatoid arthritis who is admitted with cough and shortness of breath. Serum creatinine was 2.1 on admission, up from 0.8 at baseline. And then we have this urinalysis. Um, so I think this time it's RBCs. The, the A looks like RBCs. Um, and at B is the RBC gas. I, can't see nuclei and their size seems comparable to the cells around. So um, between like a renal tubular epithelial cell and RBC, I would think that this is, this looks more like an RBC cast. And uh, this is, this looks more like a cast versus clumping because um, as you uh, taught us the outline, uh, seem the outline is prominent um so we're in the so i think we're in the territory of like an rbc um cast and that would make me think of um a, like a, a glomerulonephritis uh and i think that correlates with the blood that we see on the ua um and um um so with the um, the eucocyte estrays, I'm not sure if that's um, if that's like noise or if that's 
like a signal of an infection. Um, she was admitted for a cough and shortness of breath. Um, so I think I think the the I can just make progress up until the point that I think this is glomerulonephritis. Um, but yes. that's all. So what we're seeing here is we got a patient with respiratory symptoms, acute kidney injury, and now we've got uh, urine microscopy that shows um, red blood cells. And now what, what is special about, um, about this red blood cell down here? Does that look normal? Oh, that's a dysmorphic RBC. So if you have a dysmorphic RBC, um, and as you mentioned, that puts us into the category of a glomerulonephritis. And when you have that with pulmonary symptoms, what do you think of then? Um, I think it's a more esoteric thing, but pulmonary plus renal puts me in like the bucket of like vasculitis, um, good pasture syndrome specifically. Um, but I'm not sure if an infection would in, but that's what I think. Yeah, this is a case of ankyvasculitis, likely granulomatosis of polyangitis. It could also be microscopic polyangitis, but um, uh, that's that's an an, an, an ankyvasculitis. A small vessel vasculitis is next to, uh, affects the lung capillaries and the glomerular capillaries. This Actually, is I, have a, I have a pearl to, to give them, Eric. Okay, sure. Because I had a patient who had uh, pre presented with community acquired pneumonia that wasn't uh, really community acquired pneumonia, it was really pulmonary hemorrhage. Uh, and they had a lot of red cells. Uh, the lab did not see red cell cast, but this was up in Huntsville and it could have been. Uh, and here's the pearl uh, Good Pastures is one in 10 million, Anca is one in a million. Uh, so even if you if it's a classic picture for good pastures, ankyvasculitis is much more common if you have a pulmonary renal syndrome. Just knowing the epidemiology. And I think we're trying to move away from eponyms as a whole. So from in the renal realm, we're calling it anti-GBM, but that's too specific, perhaps. Exactly. I don't want to get rid of eponyms. Okay. All right. <laughs> Unless if no, they're, I'm just, uh, I'm just Nazis, kidding. Maybe. I'm kidding. We can oh. get rid of we can get rid of eponyms. <laughs> okay, so so this is a red blood cell cast dysmorphic RBC. Now, d identifying dysmorphic red blood cells is really important because if you see a dysmorphic RBC, then sometimes we need to put those patients on stress dose steroids before we do the kidney biopsy. And um, the dysmorphic R red blood cell is a red blood cell that squeezed through a damaged glomerulus. And it doesn't do it without sustaining some injury to the cytoplasm. So you'll get these cytoplasmic blebs. Um, here's another example of dysmorphic red blood cells. You can see sometimes there'll be two cytoplasmic blebs like a Mickey Mouse or um, one or two. This is a great example of a dysmorphic red blood cell. But there are some things in the urine that look like dysmorphic RBCs that are not. One is here. Does anybody have any idea what um, over on this left-hand panel, this black arrow, what we're pointing at here? And this can be anybody, not just our discussants, because this is a little bit challenging. Does it look like yeasts to me? It is yeast. Uh, yeah, uh, you can see yeast sometimes will look like red blood cells and when they're budding, it'll look like a dysmorphic red blood cell. Great job. What about this? What, what's the, the condition that's causing these red blood cells to look abnormal here? I think those are acanthocytes. I think liver disease. That's a good guess. Uh, these are actually crenated red blood cells. And this is what happens if you leave your urine out for too long. The, <laughs> the water will evaporate from the urine and then you're left with more osms and that uh, cells will break down. And so the water will actually leave the red blood cell and it'll shrivel up and it'll look like this. It's called a crenated red blood cell. You know, so Eric, that's, 
I think I think that that makes a very interesting point, and I know that um, you didn't specifically mention it, but just to remind everybody, if you're gonna if you're gonna look at urine, you need to look at warm urine. You need to get the urine, go straight to the lab, and have them spin it down right then, because the longer it sits around, the less useful the urinalysis is. Yeah, things will break down. You'll get misinformation. It, the The guidelines say you should look at a urine in under two hours, but I think most people will want to do it within 30 minutes uh, to an hour. Is, is that your experience at the beds uh, at the bedside when when you're doing consults and you go get the urine and look at it right away? Uh, I would say that we sometimes we'll get the urine and they'll plate it and I'll come back around to look at it and it, it'll last for about an hour, but you, you've got about an hour. Yeah. Um, and then we have some things down here on the bottom. Um, any ideas what the, this, these are? Uh, this is sometimes, it always brings a laugh to the residents when we identify this, but this is sperm. Yeah, yeah and then just uh, sometimes the sperm will lose their tails and then they'll look like dysmorphic red blood cells. Okay, this uh, has to be the end because we're, we're almost out of time. Okay, well, let, let's do this one then. A uh, 23-year-old woman with a past medical history of systemic lupus erythematosus presents with six weeks of ankle swelling. Serum creatinine is 0 0.9. Serum albumin is 2.8. And the specific gravity on the urine is 1.014, pH of 5, trace leukocyte at um, negative nitrite. Protein is uh, 3 plus, no blood. And we see this. Mm, so B and B, I think it's fat. And I remember, I'm not sure why I remember this. I'm, I, I don't know if it's correct, but I remember something about like a Maltese cross, which is like, which I think is what I'm seeing there. And I associate that with uh, fat. The other one, I guess, it has no nucleus or anything inside of it, so maybe fat as well. Um, so that with protein being three plus, um, ankle swelling, lupus, and decreased albumin, I'd be thinking about anephrotic syndrome. Um, I don't remember like anything else that I could add to it. <laughs> you got you got a lot of great stuff there. You got the Maltese cross, which is the polarized light. Uh, when you look at a lipid droplet under polarized light, you can see this formation. It looks like a Maltese cross. These are lipid droplets. This is just a combination of um, some lipid droplets, which is called a, just a, a fat body. Uh, we have oval fat bodies, which this isn't an example of one. Uh, I think I have one on the next slide. But um, And when you have a bunch of lipid that gets in the urine, that will make the urine really foamy. Just like if you were to wash your hands with soap, it gets real foamy. And so patients will complain of foamy urine. And that is a sign of nephrotic syndrome, uh, which in this case was likely due to secondary membranous from her lupus. Uh, let me see if I have that fat body. Um, um, no. Well, this is the last slide that I wanted to show you all. Um, if you're gonna, you, the cast will help to identify the type of kidney injury, and uh, there, this is not 100% like you know, Dr. Centaur mentioned. Uh, their specific specificity is probably only around 80%, but uh, these casts uh, do represent these different types of kidney disease. Eric, we we cannot thank you enough because, uh, as as so, several of us in the chat said. We, we think we were taught this in medical school, but we didn't pay attention. <laughs> and of course, I was in medical school such a long time ago, even uh, I can't even remember whether, whether I had it or not. But it, it seems so much more useful once you've been taking care of patients that this could actually help you. So, yeah, it, it can have the uh, ability to change management. So that, in my mind, is a good, good test. Yeah. This was, this was extremely useful. Um, our two-star discussants, um, 
Well, I, I think we need everybody put put up your clap reactions for uh, Secreti and Maria because uh, they, they really did great. Yeah, y'all did better than I expected. The only problem is the urine is the hardest thing to get from a patient. Travis, that's right. Uh, and that's why you have medical students on your service because they go for the first thing in the morning and, and go get the student to pee in a cup. But if you leave, 